everyone and happy Christmas if you're watching this on the day it goes up. I didn't want to miss my usual Friday upload. If you're watching it afterwards then I hope you had a nice day and if you don't celebrate Christmas then I hope you're getting to spend some family time with the school holidays and all of that. So yeah just sending you warm holiday wishes. I thought I'd film in front of my Christmas tree. I mean <laughs> it's not very Instagrammable. But um, ta-da! Does anybody else have this vibe where, I mean, it's not colour themed. The theme is that there's no theme. It's children's decorations that they've made combined with things that have been on Christmas trees since I was a child and since my husband was a child and, and things. Yeah, that's the thing. But please let me know in the comments, do you have one of these kind of very lovely trees or are you all about having the perfect tree so if you're new to my channel my name is emma i make videos about writing about indie publishing and about books and i wanted to tell you all about my favorite books from 2020 so i've gone through goodreads and looked for the ones that i gave five stars to this isn't all of them this is just the ones i actually physically own some of them were library books and there was one audiobook, so I'll put pictures in of those. But these are the ones that are actually in my collection on my bookshelf. So, I started the year with a five-star read. It was my first read of 2020. A friend of mine had recommended this to me in 2019. She'd been reading it. It may have even been just after it came out. When did it come out? Was it 2019? 20... Yeah, 2019 it was published by Penguin, so maybe and she was loving it and so I thought I'd give it a go. I treated myself and I loved this book. So the story of it is that Raina Wynn, the, um, the author, and her husband Moth, so Moth has just learnt that he is terminally ill as the book starts. They've lost their home, everything's just gone horribly wrong and they make the decision to just put all of their belongings into storage and just get their camping gear and walk the salt path, which is a a path, a coastal path that goes around sort of the Devon and Cornwall Peninsula, and it's 630 miles long from, it says from Somerset to Dorset via Devon and Cornwall. And they live basically on very little money and walking miles and miles every day, and they're going through all this emotional turmoil. And I loved this book. It's a part of the country I love anyway. I liked her writing style. I thought that it was just very thought-provoking and beautiful. I really, really liked it. And she's got another book coming out in March, which was delayed because of the pandemic. So I hope that that doesn't get delayed further, but I might pre-order it. I was going to say I'll get it when it comes out. Maybe I'll pre-order it, but I really want to read it. Um, Yeah, a really good start to the year. I loved this and thoroughly recommend if you like Book set in the southwest of England and a bit of kind of wanderlust and or wanderlust. I always say it wrong. I say it like wonder, like like I wonder, but it's wonder, wanderlust. <laughs> I find it so hard to say. Yeah, I like that. So then going through my list, what was my next five star? Ooh, I'm not sure. No more on that page. I clearly didn't read a five star read for a while after the salt path. Thing is, I read a lot of four stars. Here's the next one. So the next one was Wilding by Isabella Tree. This was another one that I treated myself to. I heard Isabella Tree on Desert Island Discs, I think, and was very interested in what she had to say. And so bought myself a copy and I loved this book. So Isabella Tree is, the, is married to a guy who inherits like a country house, but it's also a farm. So they've got like this huge estate and it was kept as a farm for a really long time, but the farming became unsustainable because of the damage to the land. And so they decided to rewild it, but they didn't just leave it just to do its own thing. They've taken conscious decisions on managing the land to try and return it to as natural a condition as they can. And it's really interesting reading about kind of how they weigh up what is natural and how they know and because their feeling is that it would be 
yes, some woodland, because it's believed that the UK was mostly woodland, but also big plains from like grazing animals. So they introduced grazing animals to the land. And you just get a lot of information about what our country maybe did look like and the various issues and how, how what they do promotes massive biodiversity. And it's so interesting if you're into sort of conservation and environmental things, very, very interesting. I'd like to go to NEP, um, which is the place they own. You can go on safari there and see all the stuff they've done. So I'd really like to do that actually. But yeah, really enjoyed that, very inspirational. It made me kind of just want to get like, grazing cows and pigs in my garden and but I think my neighbours would complain but you know if we're good <laughs> so I also treated myself to Salt on Your Tongue by Charlotte Runcie. This was one that I'd seen in the Margate bookshop in fact and just loved the cover and that's basically why I bought it. <laughs> um, I think I saw the hardback version which I believe is like a dark blue with the same kind of uh, bubbly stuff on it. Sorry, Amazon. Um, so, where was I? Yeah, so, another thing that drew me to this book was the subtitle, Women and the Sea. And I thought that this was going to be a collection of short stories. I didn't actually read the back, I literally bought it because I like the cover. And what it actually is, is, so Charlotte Runcie is talking about her pregnancy, so the whole set of stories are kind of pinned by her story of her pregnancy but she rambles so she'll talk about something that's happened to her and then she'll go off to talk about something to do with women's relationship with the sea so there's a lot of things about how um for example women would generally be on the shore while their husbands would be going off to fish and things like that so traditionally women are more linked with the shore and lots of traditions and it would go from talking about sort of sea shanties and like traditions of one village to then go on to talk about um, Greek mythology or mermaids or so it really does cover like a whole broad thing about how women link to the sea and it just was kind of beautifully rambling it's got lovely style it was just very pretty, very interesting. I actually learnt loads. Um, yeah, not what I expected, but I still really, really enjoyed it. And if you love the sea like I do, you will too. So my next five star read was To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. This is one of those that sort of everybody's read. My friend Laura gave it to me because it was in a pile of books by the side of the road that she gave me. I've talked about it on here before. She makes me read books. And this was one of them. And she'd read it and I hadn't, so she told me I had to. I It's one of those people do at school and I didn't. I did Of Mice and Men and Oliver Twist, I think. Pretty much it. And so, yeah, just had never got around to it, even with the kind of talk about it because of Go Set a Watchman. I just hadn't read it. So I didn't really even know very much about it, but I loved this book. So um, To Kill a Mockingbird... Um, to Kill a Mockingbird is about a girl called Scout and a lot of it focuses on Scout's relationship with her brother and her father, particularly her father. And it's set in America in the 1930s in the South and the backdrop to the story of kind of her relationship with the people around her is the cultural backdrop. There's a lot about society, in particular race, and I read this in sort of August, September, so it was in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests and everything, which made it even more poignant for me. And the characterization in this is amazing, but also the kind of setting the cultural atmosphere just really gave you a sense of what it would have been like to live in small town, deep South America, and yeah, that made it really thought provoking, really interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed this book. And even more than that, my husband borrowed this, I recommended it to him. And he read it and it may have been the only book he read in 2020. He doesn't read very much at all. And he might have read two books. He normally only reads one or two books a year. And he'll only pick them up if 
I really recommend it. So like, this is an amazing book. You'll really like it. And he's been known to just stop a book. He he read Shogun on my, my recommendation, which is like a thousand pages long or something. And he stopped about 10 pages from the end and was like, nope, don't like it. <laughs> so he, for him to say that he liked this, it's got to be a really good book. Otherwise he just doesn't, doesn't give it the time. He's just not interested. So yeah, it not only comes on my recommendation, but he really liked it too. But yeah, finally read it. Don't know why I hadn't before, just hadn't, I guess, but I'm glad that I did and I really enjoyed it. Just found it so, so thought provoking and moving and yeah, loved it, loved that one. Then immediately after I read that, I read Dear NHS, 100 Stories to Say Thank You by Adam Kay. This was one that my brother bought me for my birthday and I've read This Is Going To Hurt and Twas The Night Shift Before Christmas and enjoyed both of those a lot. I'm pretty sure that they were both five star reads. This is going to hurt at least, definitely was. Um, so yeah, I was interested to read this. I hadn't picked it up, although I'd seen it around and I follow Adam Kay on Instagram, so I'd seen it, but I don't know why. I, I, I think I just thought it was more of him. And although I like his writing, I just, didn't, wasn't interested enough to pick it up, if, if you see what I mean, even though I really like it, I just, I don't know, I just didn't. Um, but actually, that's not what this book is. This is, it's actually over 100, but I forget how many, and it's all of these people, <laughs> and it's their letters, basically, and their stories of their experiences of the NHS. So these are all famous people. So for example, you've got somebody like, what's her name? The lady who was a nurse, and is now a comedian, and my brain is just, it's gone, it's gone, can't see her name. I'll put it underneath, because I can't think at all. But that lady, whoever that is, um, talking about her experiences of working within the NHS, as well as people giving birth, or having an accident, or thinking they've got something when they haven't actually got it, or... Um, stories of like when family members die and, and just stories of the NHS and what the NHS has done for these people and what it means to these people and um, it's so it's so varied everybody's got a different experience everybody has a very different style there were some that I really loved there were some that I wasn't that bothered by but I really like that it's very emotional there's a lot of really funny stories you've got a lot of comedians in here but there's also tragedy and yeah it was it was really interesting as well with people who I like and then they they tell you a story that you know I had no idea Joe Brand <laughs> that's who it is um they tell you something, you think, oh God, I didn't know that happened to that person. So yeah, I really enjoyed that and would recommend as well. And especially with everything with the clapping for the NHS and how everybody's felt about the NHS and everything everybody's been through. Um, really good book. Also, it supports some charities. It supports NHS charities together and the Lullaby, Lullaby, the Lullaby Trust, which are both amazing charities. So again, recommend. I really, really liked that. Um, next, I'm going to say I recommend all of them, obviously, because they're all five star reads. Um, what was my next one? Marley and Me. I feel like I've missed some. I might have to go. Yeah, I definitely have. Okay, that's fine. We're not doing these in order. That was a lie. Um, Marley and Me, I read relatively recently. I read it in October. And I hadn't read this. I picked it up in a charity shop. I've seen the film and I fancied a bit of kind of lightish reading and so yeah just picked it up and I loved it I had no idea that the story of Marley and Me was based on a real story so it's actually the author John Grogan's dog I, I didn't know that I thought it was made up and because of that it just broke my heart like the film is sad enough but realizing that this was a real dog and a real family and the, although the dog's story is central, what you see is this family kind of developing and growing as they have children and the children get older and the dog gets older. And My dog is nine and so she's starting to go grey around the muzzle and she's slowing down and she's, and it just, it's so sad. So yeah, sad, but I think I read this in a day. It's just an easy read, an emotional read. I really liked it. 
that's it. <laughs> um, okay, what next? I'm going to go back and see what I missed. Because um, I definitely missed a few. Do, 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 do. Oh yeah, this one. So this is Cycling for Health by Dara Casey. This, so Dara was one of my Patreons and I worked with him a little bit on publishing this. Um, and he, so he is a nurse and he's very enthusiastic about cycling and he wanted to put together this teeny little book. So it's just a little easy read that's about cycling and how it can benefit lots of different things to do with society. So it's, it goes through um, the environment and education and health and human connection and lots of different things. And it had some things where I'd never thought about. So for instance, when you cycle, you're more likely to stop and talk to people than you are when you drive a car. Just little things. I was like, oh yeah, no, I suppose that's right. And just the, the pace and the social side of it. Very interesting. This is a teeny little book but so much information packed into it, it's really well researched. Uh, when he published it, and I believe it's still the case, Dara had a free ebook version on his website so that it could be shared because he wants this to be shared amongst sort of politicians and people involved in health and you know the people that matter to show how investment in cycling would have really positive consequences and I read this so fast, maybe in like an hour, it's only small, but learn loads. I thought it really, really good. It's so concisely written, but really accessible. Um, I found myself having long discussions with my husband about the stuff that was in here. So thought provoking, I really, really liked that and gave that five stars too. And I fully recommend, he's an indie writer, so go support him, leave him a review and all that stuff. Who, what else did I read? Okay, this one I missed as well when I was going through, The Secret Garden. This was one of our um, lockdown books that we read as a family. So what we did was during homeschool, we read, read a chapter of a book every day and The Secret Garden was one of those. And I was just picking kind of classics off of my shelf that the kids hadn't read. And so, um, oh, and what we were doing is we were writing them down and then we were picking them out of a hat. So The Secret Garden was one of those. And we loved this as a family. It was just so gentle. And we'd been spending loads of time in the garden, um, watching birds and all sorts, and just sort of enjoying the outside, going for long walks. And so this really fed into how we were feeling at the time about spending more time outside and all of that. And um, yeah, we just loved it. <laughs> it's very gentle, it's very kind. Um, there, are the, there are some negative parts in the, because of the time when it was written and uh, the main character, I haven't said what it's about, have I? If you haven't read it, it's about a girl called Mary Lennox who her parents die in a cholera outbreak. So she lives in India and her parents die. She moves to England to live with her uncle in this big country house. And there's a lot of mystery and a lot of kind of sadness and darkness and bleakness. And it's about her kind of bringing light into everybody's lives and everybody growing and developing. And um, there are elements of it that are of its time. And one of the things is it has some really negative things about Indian people. And, but in context, when it's Mary who says some of the nasty things and she's meant to be not a nice girl at those times. So in context, I think it's okay, but there is that. But I mean, it's such a short part and actually we discussed it as a family because I think that's important to talk about, for us to talk about why that's not okay, why, it might have been people's views then and what the historical situation was and all of that and kind of have it as a discussion. Um, but yeah, so that's the only thing. But for us, it just really fitted how we were feeling um, in terms of, like I say, just the outside. We really enjoyed it. We all got a bit obsessed with Robins. <laughs> so yeah, as a family, this was just one we really enjoyed together. It took us a long time to read because we did it a bit a day, as I say. Um, the next one is a 
um, audiobook and it is Ramble Book by Adam Buxton so I listened to this on audio and he so the release of his book was delayed I believe it's out now the physical copy but he because so he's a podcaster and he produced the audiobook himself so that came out I believe when the book was meant to come out but the actual physical copy was delayed and we were meant to go and see him. He's one of my favourite comedians. I've watched him since the 90s. I used to watch the Adam and Joe show when I was a teenager and I wasn't supposed to. And um, I've followed his podcast for years. And so, yeah, we, we were going to go and see the... There was like a show that went with the book release. But that was cancelled. It's been delayed, actually. We still have tickets. So, um... Yeah, so I listened to the audiobook and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> surprise, surprise, these are my favourite books. Basically, it's... So Adam Buxton is a comedian and he talks a lot about pop culture. So there's a lot of stuff about Bowie, a lot of things about kind of 80s pop culture. But in amongst that is the story of his elderly father moving in with him because he's dying. So you have a lot of discussions of family. Adam talks about his his childhood and and he and he like his family and he went to private school so it talks about that and just it, I mean it's a memoir but it's it's very it's very like of its bleh, it's very gives a sense of kind of growing up in the 80s and like film and music and a certain kind of family and a certain, it just gives you like a real it's not even necessarily that it's about him, it's just about kind of that time as well. But it's it's really funny in parts because he's a comedian, but it's also really emotional and it's it's got a really nice balance in that respect. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. At some point I will buy the physical book because supposedly that's got a bit more, I think it's got like illustrations and photos and so I would like the physical copy, but the audio book's really good and it comes with a bonus interview with Joe Cornish who is Adam Buxton's best friend and where Joe kind of critiques the book so yeah it's very good and Adam reads it to you he there's like extra bits so he kind of adds extra bits of description and it's good I really recommend the audiobook but I probably will read the physical one as well at some point next one I'm going back in time the time's all over the place forget the reading these in order it's not happening um I got a load of library books during the last day before lockdown started I went and panic bought at the library so I went and got a massive stack I got I don't know 30 books or something so some of those were really good um I don't own them so I'll put a thing by my fish tank hello fish um so the first one I'm going to talk about is Bill Bailey's Remarkable Guide to British Birds like I say we were a bit obsessed by birds this book was so good because I'm not, you know, I like sea creatures. Birds aren't really my thing. I, I mean, they're very pretty, but I don't know much about them. And this, because it was funny, it just made you care, if that makes sense. It made the birds really interesting because he picked out funny little features. Each bird had like um, a, a double page spread or maybe three pages about it with funny little drawings and just told you kind of an overview of the characteristics of that bird. It was so easy to read. I lent it to my son who's 10 and he really enjoyed it and found it accessible as well. There was nothing that was inappropriate for him. I think there's the odd bit about like courtship or mating, but that was okay. Um, yeah, so it was just a really good, if you're not super into your birds, so you're not looking for anything with kind of new information you don't want something really super detailed if you just want something that's going to get you a bit into the birds that you see in your garden or the birds you see when you go to the beach or whatever it's really good um especially if you like bill bailey what else was there okay so another library book that i read was journeys in the wild the secret life of a cameraman by gavin thurston this one i saw in in our library <sighs> ages ago and took a photo of it because I liked the cover because I liked the mustard yellow on it and didn't even read the back I just took a picture of it and then when I went panic buying at the library I um obviously not actually buying but you know what I mean because there was a whole panic buying thing and my my panic was all about the books to make sure I had books anyway 
I, I specifically looked for that one because I'd like the cover and I was trying to just choose books and I had no idea. So I was like, oh, that one, that one. And I was like, oh, there's that one I took a picture of. So I found it. And as I say, didn't really know anything about it. But anyway, Gavin Thurston, who is the, the author, he is a cameraman for things like Planet Earth and um, Blue Planet and all the kind of Attenborough stuff. Other things as well, but primarily he's worked with Attenborough a lot. And it's basically diaries. And it was so interesting. It went through sort of little technical things of how he'd managed to film a particular thing or how they'd found a certain animal. And then stories about traveling to all these places and trying to, trying to, work in certain conditions and how they managed to get a shot of a certain animal because of the complications of this that and the other and traveling at certain times in like certain political climates and and various things and working with David Attenborough and these are shows that I have loved since I was a kid so reading more about the cameraman was so interesting and since when I've been watching stuff I see it come up on the credits I'm like Gavin Thurston I know who he is now and I once went to a lecture by a nature camera person and it was so interesting them talking about using hides and how how they do it. So I've, I've kind of always found it quite interesting. But if you like those documentaries, you would really enjoy this. Um, or to be honest, if you're kind of just into the natural world or camera work. But yeah, there's like lots of funny stories, but there's also some sort of scary things that happen and emotional things and really good. And again, I lent it to my son and he thoroughly enjoyed it. So, and again, it was it was appropriate, it was fine. Always, as I've said on here before, if you, if you check, because it depends on your kid, but um, yeah, he, he was fine with it. Um, I always read them first before I, I pass them on. So the next one that was a five star read for me was, where did I get to? I think we're coming up to the tail end of the year now. And it was, I can't find it. Um, <laughs> I don't know where it was, but the five, I think this is the only one I haven't talked about. Yeah. So the five I read fairly recently, I'd like to say probably October, but I can't see it for some reason on Goodreads. I'm pretty sure it was sort of October time. And this was one that I treated myself to because I'd seen people talking about it on Bookstagram and Booktube and I thought it sounded really interesting. So this is The Untold Lives of the Women Killed by Jack the Ripper. So Jack the Ripper is well known, but the women that he killed weren't. And they were largely kind of written off as prostitutes. They were poor people, they were drunk, they were prostitutes, you know. So they were just kind of written out of the history almost. People don't know their names, people don't know what happened to them. And the truth is that other than one of them, they weren't really prostitutes and they had awful things happen to them that ended up with them living in kind of the slums of London and then becoming at risk. And this book tells you a lot about how society was at that time in Victorian times and the, the pressures um, the issues with things like alcohol, the issues with poverty and the, the cleanliness and the slums and the things like if somebody lost their job, you know, and because the woman couldn't necessarily work. So if the man lost his job and he couldn't get another job or if he died and then everything would just go wrong. Um, it's very interesting. It does make you examine things like how history is told and um yeah it's it doesn't focus at all on the women being killed there's probably about two pages in this maybe more maybe like three pages about the actual murders themselves it's not about that it's about the lives of these women and the writer Hallie Rubenhold doesn't necessarily hasn't necessarily found evidence for everything so sometimes she knows sort of the known movements of those women but other times she doesn't really know and so she talks about what's likely and what is known about society at the time and how things worked and um, talks a lot about things like the poor houses and um, the workhouses 
um, like the cheap rooms that people could rent and so that they weren't sleeping on the streets and how that worked and it's just it's such an eye into society at that time and the effects of poverty and thinking about the feminism of the issue where the women no one was particularly interested and yeah really good basically an unknown history um and even though it's complicated history <laughs> like lots of facts and figures and this happened that and all the ins and outs totally accessible really readable um so yeah really good would recommend very very thought-provoking very shocking um but really well written and really important as well so that's it most of the ones that i really enjoyed were non-fiction but there's no surprise there because that's my fave um but some new books and surprise books these these were the ones, like I said, that I actually own. Um, yeah, I like them. They're good. Have a look. I'll put them on um, on bookshop.org, but you can also look on Goodreads if you want to have a look. Um, yeah, what have you read in 2020 that's really stayed with you, that you've really enjoyed? What were your favourites? I would absolutely love to know. And based on the books I enjoy, what should I read in 2021? Please give me some recommendations. So <laughs> if you enjoyed this <laughs> if you enjoyed this please hit like don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and do leave me a comment about have you read any of these what would you recommend and all that stuff have a very happy christmas if the day isn't over for you yet and enjoy the rest of the festive season if not and yeah happy christmas <laughs> and i will see you all soon for another video take care <laughs>